Children are gifts. They are not ours for the breaking. They are ours for the making. Dan Pierce, author of The Real Dad Rules. All right, Jason. So how are you today? I am doing well. Thank you so much for having me on. Awesome. It's been, it's a pleasure. And so folks, we are going to we're going to have a very uh heart to heart conversation. Some of you may find this a little bit unpleasant. Um, you know, and and maybe you'll disagree, maybe you'll agree, that's fine. I think this is a fair conversation to have. You know, as again, these are topics where dads come on and they talk about what's important to them. And sometimes we, you know, we share some things, you know, some details and intimacy about our families. And so that's what we're going to do today. So Jason, you wanted to talk about, uh, you know, managing and, you know, the topic that we'll do, we'll kind of cover is managing your child's identity. And when I say managing, I mean that from a parental perspective, because as a parent, it is our job to help our children navigate the world uh, un- until such time that they leave the nest. And then even still after that, like when I was 18, I left the nest, but I called my mom on a regular basis and I'm like, Hey mom, what should I do about this? What should I do about that? Right? So your parenting does not end necessarily at 18, but let's hear your story, Jason. And then we'll, we'll discuss it and we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I, I, I think you started off with this with a, a great springboard and like the role of being a parent on this of like, you know, what is my role as a dad? And and I've got two two girls, a, a 14 year old and now just a five year old um, as of yesterday. And and my role for both of them, I, I kind of tried to boil things down as much as I could. My role is to make sure that they are successful and what success looks like for you, what success looks like for me, what success looks like for them is always different. Everyone has different goals and and everything else. And so for me, what lines up with their personality? What are the things that they're interested? My oldest, she loves uh, playing softball. She's doing incredible things. So we try to to get her into trainings and all these other things. And so we want to be able to push her to have that be an opportunity for success for her. Right. In schooling, she's got another field. And, um, for a while, we did have her in, in public schooling, and um, she was doing great in school. She was getting high marks. We were helping her with learning how to study, how to do homework, and, and doing um, you know essays, being able to find and tailor her schooling to what's going to make her successful. Um, she was finding wild well success. Mm-hmm. And we started noticing a change in, in her character and the way that she was acting, she was coming into uh, preteens at the time. And so it's like, all right, is this, you know, is this from maturity? Is this puberty? Right. Is this, you know, her circle of friends? She's coming into a new area. What's kind of, what's kind of going on here. And so we started, you know, in both my wife and I started engaging a lot more with her, um, not prodding, but, but, you know, asking the questions that were a little more than surface level of, you know, what's going on with your friends and this, that, and the other. And, and what we had been able to determine and what honestly became a problem was that there was a level in which she was trying to hide something from us and, and her being young and youthful, we all know that, you know, they're right. they're not the best at lying. And so we started started uncovering some things. We found out that she had developed a relationship with somebody. And we've always been the household. I, I'm my wife makes fun of me. I'm the I'm the redneck. I'm the the guy that you don't want to bring your boyfriend home to because I'm right. gonna sit there with a the shotgun. And um, we joke about that, but but in all seriousness, we're open to it. We know kids are going to be interested. We just want to make sure that they're they're practicing um, safe activities they're doing things that are on their age level um the, i realized i said safe activities that doesn't mean sex at, at such right. a young age but it's it's you know things that are, are are on their age and so we started you know okay why were you hiding this relationship from us um she started hiding things on her on her tech and everything else and so me and my wife 
were kind of shocked. It was unlike her in every way. Come to find out that the person that she was in in um, a relationship with was a was a a, a girl that had transitioned, and so okay. now she she felt um, she had transitioned to become a boy. So now she had a boyfriend. And so we had to have that conversation with her because she didn't fully understand. She came into the circle of friends. She was attracted to this person. She wanted to have a relationship. I said, hey, if that's if that's the way your wind blows, like that's if that's what's going to bring you success, you're you know, that's that's cool. With it. Let me talk to you about this. Let me explain to you a little bit more about this. Mm -hmm. And that is something I was never prepared for. Right. I, I, I don't even think I ever had the birds and bees talks for my parents. I had to figure it out. I was at the time right. it was AOL. So I was like, download a couple JPEGs at a time to try to figure things out. But, you know, I had to have that conversation with her. And my wife had the conversation. Continuing to develop through that. We found out that about five out of the seven friends that she was with were in within the, the GSM community, the gender and sexual minority community. Mm -hmm. um, which is, again, not a problem at all. People want to express themselves the way that they want to. But I think when you get to such a collective, is this a, a collective that was created artificially by mm -hmm. there's a, a, a peer pressure into I'm now a gay man. I'm now bisexual. I'm now a lesbian. I'm now, you know, I'm mm -hmm. now different than what um, than the status quo because of peer pressure, or is this a natural thing where they just happen to uh, group together and, and be a part of that? No problems. Um, if it was a natural thing, if it was a peer pressure thing, and that's kind of where we determined it to, to be with having mm -hmm. a couple conversations with the friends, we said, you know, we had to sit her down and break that down. It's not an easy conversation. Um, I know a lot of people in comment sections across Facebook and across all of social media, they want to portray it as, you know, this is just a mental illness. And I think that it really is a, a, a lot deeper of a conversation. Right. Um, when I, when I first started politics, when I first started podcasting 2016, 2017, um, this was the conversation I really cut my teeth into was the LGBT movement mm -hmm. and trying to understand it. I, I came from a conservative background. I came from a military background. I didn't know things. And so I was just, for lack of a better term, throwing out ignorant comments and, and, and statements. I felt like because I was a normal person that everyone who wasn't normal had a mental illness. Right. And I'm concerned. I was concerned that um, a lot of these kids would have the same things be pushed onto them. I could not imagine living my life where everyone thought that I was mentally insane. Right. If I genuinely felt some way, I have PTSD. People think I'm mentally insane. It might be true. Um, <laughs> comes right. with the territory. But um, but we 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 sat her down, and and probably the hardest thing that we had to discuss was does this feel normal to you? Because she started to show some inclinations. She started to be like, well, maybe, maybe I'm bisexual. Maybe I'm gay. Mm -hmm. How do I, as a parent say that that's okay. And also want, have that inner desire. I want a daughter who's going to raise up to have grandchildren. Right. And my wife and I struggle with that a lot. We both came from conservative backgrounds. And ultimately, we had to come to the decision that her peer group was artificially pushing this on each other, encouraging each other. One right. girl asked my daughter when she started, when she first moved to the school, I'm a lesbian. Do you support me? Didn't introduce herself. Didn't say, how are you doing today? Walked right. up to her and said, I'm a lesbian. Do you support me? Wow. That's pretty wild because, you know, when when your child and, and I'm going to be speaking kind of like in, in terms of future me, because yeah. current me is with a five year old. So we don't have to worry about these conversations right now. And um, but my, I imagine that what ends up happening is you are living with your child. You are having interactions with your child and you kind of perceive your child's identity, if you will, 
to be in a particular way for many, many years. And then it seems kind of like all of a sudden the child has changed, right? Like in this particular case, like, hey, dad, I may be one of these other things. And I can understand, at least without having experienced it, I can understand where a parent might be kind of, it might be jarring to them. It might be a little startling. Like, wait a minute, what? Like, when did this happen? Yeah. And, and let me say this. I think, and again, I'm speaking out of ignorance. I want to make that abundantly clear to anybody that's listening. I'm, I'm, you know, not pretending to know what I'm talking about just yet. But just based on observation of other people and just kind of thinking about this, you know, myself, um, it seems to me that this would be a, a bit of a shock because did you miss something as a parent, right, like along the way? And then also when you're talking about like, well, wait a minute, what if this is artificial? Well, many kids get in groups and the behavior is artificial, right? And we, and, and nobody questions it. Like when I was growing up and I got into, I got hanging out with the wrong crowd and I started doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, you know, going out and damaging property and getting into fights and, you know, in doing all these things, that wasn't my normal behavior. That was every bit um, artificially generated through the crowd that I was associating with. And, you know, I, and I feel like we, we, for things like that, we're more than wel uh, welcoming to parents to say, oh, yeah, you're right. That's probably just the crowd they're hanging out with. But then it comes to the GSM community or the LGBTQ plus whatever, right? And, and then all of a sudden, there's like this red line drawn. It's like, no, no, that cannot be artificial. That's entirely real. So let me ask you, and, and you know, because you know your child, uh, you had been living with, you know, you're born and raised, your, your child was born and raised, living with you for all these years, dinner conversations all the time, going out, you know, family events, you know, all these different things, right? Checking homework and whatnot. What, what were some of the signs to you that said, this is artificial a above and beyond just awkward introductions? Um, so for us, it really came down to her hiding it, right? Mm. So with my my children, we are um, a lot of parents. They, I feel like when they talk to their kids, they say, "You can tell me anything. I'm I'm your parent, but I'm also your friend." And and they leave it at that. But they're still the disciplinary. They're still like the parent, if you will. And and those lines rarely get crossed where the kid is like actually forthcoming and open. Mm -hmm. um, we've been incredibly blessed with, um, with both of our girls that, you know, when they do something wrong, um, we've instilled integrity to where they're willing to come forward and talk to us and say, mm -hmm. Hey, mm -hmm. I've messed up. Hey, I didn't do this homework. I didn't do this. I didn't, I didn't study for this test. That's why I got bad marks. Like they're very forthcoming with everything and anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but when it came to my daughter in this situation, what she would do is she would, instead of being open and out with the family, hanging out and playing games, she'd be like, I want to go to bed early. I want to go in and she would have her tablet or she would have her cell phone at the time. And she would rather be secluded and separated in a way, which I understand is like if you have a, a if you have somebody you want to pursue in a relationship, you're going to want to do that. And that's fine. She had mentioned boys in the past, but this one was a special situation. And so kind of that hiding, that that holding things close to her chest, if you will, um, kind of was the big something's wrong here. And okay. you had spoken about how you had the peer pressure of what you had done in, in your youth. I was very much the same way. Right. I had done a lot of bad things and I kept that very close to my chest. And so I was right. able to see my own actions, my own hidings, my own um, level of deceit as a child and see mm -hmm. that in her. And so my alarms were, were, were raised and I wanted to pursue that because it's not. I didn't want to pursue this because I wanted to find her in a lie. I wanted to pursue this to make sure that she was making good decisions for herself that would be able mm -hmm. to protect herself. 
and and it started down um, a terrible path. And and um, I think that this is something that may be topical for a lot of uh, kids with with or a lot of parents with kids right now is through that circle of friends, they were pushing to go on to things like Omegle at night where so, late at uh, night. Yeah. Omegle. Like, what is that? Omegle is basically an online chat room where you're getting set up with random people around the world. And oh. so just a webcam and a microphone and you're ready to go. And mm. so if you can imagine with it being mostly adults, uh, how risky it can be for one for children to be viewing the, such materials, but two also for somebody who doesn't know how to practice, uh, you know, uh, operational risk management of like, Hey, uh, do I provide my real name? Do I provide right. any of my locality, any of my situation right. to where people can dox and, and find you? Um, so she was going down a very dangerous path and her being a, a, a preteen and even a young teen had that ego of, I know what I'm doing. I can protect myself. Right. I can do all these things. My friends have and done so she, it. I will be able to successfully do it just like my friends have. And they're still here. Yeah, exactly. Like, same. Exactly. Yeah. So she was going down that path of, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to bring my parents into this. And that was kind of like the big red alarms. And so um, we were able to kind of tackle this and, and the feelings that she had developed through that situation, uh, through those friendships. Um, she's kind of come through that. She's back to, to, I don't want to say it that way. She's back to her normal self. Of, right looking at boys at church and, and trying to have conversations, being terrible at flirting with them. Right. Being, being more afraid of dad making fun of her for, for some of the jokes on the sideline, like, you know, just back to, to the wholesome girl that she was and she's being very forthcoming again. And she's so back it, to the original person that you knew. Right. And this is kind of what yes. I was driving at a moment ago when I said, you know, it, it, it seems like you've got this person who has been developing that, you know, and then all of a sudden they shift gears or they take, you know, a different path. And I won't call it necessarily a negative path, but it's a very out of the ordinary path. And you're like, wait a minute, this is not the person that I've been watching 10, 12, 13 years grow. You have all of a sudden kind of shifted your personality. A lot of behaviors have changed dramatically. And so when you say go back, when you, when you say this is back to the, 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 you know, going back or whatever, it's going back to that original person who had, who carried the same behaviors, I presume, yes. Yes. Um, being more open, more willing to share. Uh, and I, and I think, I don't know about you, but I think that it's very normal for teenagers to want to hide some things from their parents. Uh, you know, so I, like like this idea, like I've seen people say, and especially around this particular topic, they're like, if a child doesn't want to tell you something, what does that say about you? And I'm like, well, I, I think it depends on what the topic is. I mean, if it's if it's a boy and you had, you know, your child had previously been like willing to say, yeah, there's a cute boy at school that I that I'm really, you know, I find attractive or he's, you know, he's cute or whatever. And they were willing to share that information even slightly. And then all of a sudden they're unwilling to share that information. Well, what's the difference, right? What, what has changed such that they went from sharing to not sharing when we're basically talking about, you know, romantic relationships, like, you know, you know, and so I feel like, you know, these are the things that parents would know that other people wouldn't know. And so, uh, let me ask you, um, they say that a lot of this trans issue when it comes to kids is very, um, what's the term that they use? It's you, you were saying it wasn't organic. It was artificial, but there was another term that people like to use. It's called, um, um, I try to think of it on the fly. Um, like a, uh, a contagion. They, 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 a lot of people will call it like a contagion. So let me ask you, do you feel like th there's a lot of conversation out there that's like, hey, you can't talk to your parents. We, we see all the time schools are like creating these environments where you can come and talk to the teacher and we'll hide this from your parents. And I feel like in some ways 
there may be some kids who cannot talk to their parents, but yes. I think there are many kids and the reality is they can talk to their parents. The kids probably know that they can talk to their parents, but this conversation, the way that it's being had is actually bringing kids into this group of kids who, who say, I can't talk to my parents who actually can. So it's like, you, you know, you maybe, maybe there's 30 kids and out of those 30 kids, maybe, and I'm just making up numbers, maybe 25 of them actually can talk to their parents about this stuff without re any fear of reprisal. Five of them cannot. And then through these adult conversations that we keep having, what you end up, ha what you end up getting is that maybe 10 of those kids now decide I can't tell my parents about this. And so five of them have been brought in and, and, and now we've kind of artificially blown up you know, the numbers of kids who feel like they can't talk to their parents. Do you feel like the conversation in any way, let, uh, you know, contributed, or do you think it was really all about the social group that she was with? I, I think for, um, I, I'll have to speak in a little generalities here, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I hate to give praise to this woman. Kamala said it pretty well the other day, mm -hmm. 18 to 24 year olds. They're stupid. Um, right. <laughs> Going younger than that, they're just as bright. So right. when we talk about these kids, a lot of them do have that fear mentality of I was I didn't have something that was ordained or blessed by my parents. Mm -hmm. Will I get in trouble for this? And right. and I think that there is a large amount of kids that are afraid to talk to their parents mm -hmm. because they're afraid of how their parents would react. Right. If the stigma that my daughter had when she talked about her first crush to my wife of me and my reaction, if she held that for anything, um, if she continued to hold that because we were able to break down that barrier. And I said, look, mommy paints me as like a, a what's the term? A burnt marshmallow where I'm like right. hard and rigid on the outside by a movie and gooey in the center or something. Gotcha. Like that. Okay. Um, it's, um, she learned then that she could talk to me and it wasn't yeah. about things that I wanted to talk about. It wasn't about things that I was comfortable talking about, but she could literally talk to me and my wife about anything. And that was very important. And mm -hmm. so sometimes you have to take those things as parents and, and you have to realize like, if we can all remember back to when we were kids and the struggles that we faced and the, mm -hmm. the, the choices that we made and how we wanted to hide things and keep things away, why did we want to do so? Right. For my parents, you know, the belt was not an uncommon uh, occurrence. You know, mm -hmm. groundings mm -hmm. was not an uncommon occurrence. Right. So these were things that would deter me from bringing things forward. I would be less in trouble if I brought them forward, but that meant that I was still in trouble. Right. And so for me, um, growing up, I didn't want to bring things forward. And so I had to find a way to actively check that mindset of me as a parent. How do I break these barriers down? How do I allow for these, for my daughter to speak to me on issues that she's not comfortable with, that I'm not comfortable with, and nobody wants to have these conversations right. it's like life insurance. Nobody wants to talk about actual life insurance, but you have to have them. Right. And so we were able to break that down for her, but I think for the, for the vast majority of kids, it's, it really is kind of what you were talking about. There's a stigma of you can't talk to your parents about this. Mm -hmm. You're going to, you're going to get reprimanded. You're going to get shunned in some way. And there are egregious, horrible cases where kids are, mm -hmm. and they allowed for that. And I, I can't speak to this on a factual basis, but they allow for that to be portrayed as the majority of cases. Right which I think does every kid a disservice. Right. I'm concerned overall with parents communicating with their children, with them having the engagement and involvement. Um, for anyone who recognizes me, I used to work for you at You Are The Power. I had a full-time job and I also worked at You Are The Power. And I was in, investing so much time into our future as a family by working so much. I invested so much time into you are the power into my occupation that I wasn't able to be the dad that I needed to be for both my girls, mm -hmm. my, my wife working full time. She's, you know, we were not able to give our full every day at any moment to our children. And that was starting to strain a little bit on the car or strain our relationships. But our focus has always been for our girls. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so we have to be selfless in that. And so I think that that's the biggest calling that I have for parents and dads and, and everyone else is how are you setting up the next generation? Right. We're looking to make things better. We want to make our children happy. We want to make them successful. These conversations have to be had. And so how can you make sure that your kid, if your kid is in that circle of 30, how can you make sure that your kid is the one that says, I can talk to you, dad. I can right. talk to you, mom. And, and, and let me say this. I don't want to place all the blame on society who goes out there and they're trying to be the allies and they're trying to be the ones that offer a, you know, a safe place for kids that may actually have a legitimate issue. I don't want to place all the blame on them because in my opinion, if, if parents are ranting and raving at home about things, a lot, you know, certain things, then I think their kids will see that. And whereas maybe a child might say, well, okay, I experimented with marijuana, but I know my, I know I can go and talk to my mom or my dad about this and they're not going to flip out. But man, every time they're watching TV and something about trans comes up and they start, you know, talking crazy. Well, you know, if they end up getting in that circle of friends, if they end up exploring that path, well, then I think the message has been sent to them from their own parents. And I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile to point out that as parents, we have a duty to be as consistent as possible in all matters. Um, because you never know what your child, because the, the fact of the matter for me is I think that some, ch- that some uh, young people will just explore a bunch of different avenues, right? They'll explore different avenues and, you know, it, you, you want your child to come and talk to you, uh, about, you know, some of them may not be a big deal, right? They explore video gaming, probably not going to be a big deal, right? Like other than maybe playing too much. But if they explore like, you know, different identities, uh, especially with the arguments and debates that we're having in society today, that could that could end up being a serious thing. If they explore drugs, that could end up like if it's just marijuana, probably going to be fine. But if they go past that, you never. And then I'm not I'm not trying to play the the gateway drug necessarily. Yeah. If they go past that, it it's hard to say where are they going to go and what are they going to get. Right. And so we I think it's I think it's worthwhile. And I do that already. And I think, I think that starts as early as you possibly can. So one of the things that we do is we're constantly telling our son, we're like, don't tell us lies, tell us the truth. And, and we'll tell him in a firm way, but we're not like, I can't believe you told a lie. Cause one, he's five. I mean, so like, of course, half the time his imagination is running. Right. Yep. Uh, you know, so <laughs> we've, we've got, a, we've got a balance between his imagination and whether he's actually being, you know, intentionally uh, 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 untruthful about something which I think like probably 90% of the time, it's really just his imagination. And maybe there's a small fraction of the time where he's being untruthful, um, mostly because he might, you know, I don't want you to take this away from me or something like that. Like, I don't want to get in trouble, you know, f- for having done this. But I'll give you an example of how we, of how I did that. When we were, you know, we, we, we got the daytime potty training down pat. Then it came to doing the nighttime potty training. And, you know, accidents happen. And so... Yeah we made a commitment and it was, I mean, it's not like we sat down and discussed it, but it was just kind of like, we just did it that we would never yell at him under any circumstances for, for having wet the bed because like he's practicing, he's learning, right? Like, so why, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense. Um, the closest that he got was he had a little child's tent in his room and he would sometimes sleep Mm. in his bed. Sometimes he would go into the, the tent and sleep. And I went into his room one day, to grab something or whatever. I was like, what is that smell? And I, I, I get close, I get closer to the tent and I'm like, it's stronger over here. And I poke my head in and I was like, Whoa. And so he had wet the, the blankets or whatever. And they happened to be in there. Now he didn't get scolded, but I kind of firmly told him, I was like, son, you have to tell mommy and daddy when you wet the bed where we, so we can wash your sheets that way. You don't have to sleep on dirty stuff, you know? Yeah. And so, and, and, and I was firm in a way that I'm, I wasn't, again, he didn't really get in trouble. I didn't, you know, he didn't get a spanking or anything. He didn't get scolded, none of that stuff, but I was more firm in that particular sense and maybe more stern, uh, than I was when he would come in the bedroom and be like, Hey dad, you know, in the morning, be like, Hey mom and dad, I went to bed. We'd be like, okay, let's go take care of it. And so we would go and we take care of it, 
you know, very neutral, you know, without making a big fuss of it whatsoever. You know, and I think that as long as we apply this same concept as they're getting older to new things, right, I think we can be consistent with them and they can start developing this understanding because in as much as you learn your child, they learn you. Yes. Right. And they learn and, and they'll pick up on things that we don't even realize they pick up on and they will pick up on very quickly. Okay. That's something I can't tell dad about. Right. So, okay. Back to your story. So now you've, you've had this heart to heart. How did, in, in, in feel free to omit or just move on past or whatever, yeah. but how did your, you know, how did the conversation with your daughter initially start? Was it difficult to kind of, to really get her to come around and be open or was it just like a matter of sitting down and having a few conversations and then it just kind of naturally came out? Like, like what was this process like? So it, it actually came in a way that actually makes me look a little bit like the bad guy. And I think that that's fine. I think being a dad means that we have to face up and, and right. fess out. Um, and so this came to a head when I found her on that Omegle site mm -hmm. uh, at three o'clock in the morning. Mm. Um, so she was staying up really late to, to hang out on there because she knew she couldn't be doing that during the day. And so I had taken, taken her phone in, in anger, um, took that away from her, removed the line entirely off of the bill. Um, she no longer had internet capabilities for that. And so we started and, and that started the unraveling. And so took it to the next day and we found out, Hey, where did you learn this from? Who was teaching you this? Cause you don't just type in omegle.com and be like, Oh, this is how I work this. I've never um, heard this. Yeah, no, you're better off for it. Um, sorry for bringing you this bad news. Um, but it, it, it'll be, it'll be another site when my son is yes, of age, when, he, when he's at it age. will be, it, it definitely will be. And, um, and so it started from there and then we started unraveling some things and we saw some key behavior differences and, and we started highlighting them because now me and my wife are both investigative mode. What are the things that she's hiding? What are the, what are the behaviors that have changed? And so we started trying to figure these things out on our end and mm -hmm. in quiet conversations between me and my wife. Um, we started highlighting, Hey, here's this thing. Here's this thing. Here's this indicator. Here's this other one. This is a behavior that's been different. And so we were able to unravel and we were able to find out what their song was there. Because if you remember way back when in, in middle school, when you started dating a girl and you were like, this is our song. And it, for right. me, like it was Usher. It was like right. Usher. Yeah. whatnot. So we found out that she kept asking for the same song. Hmm. We're like, and it's a song that we've been listening to for some time. Mm -hmm. So we said, hey, what's what's the significance for the song? Oh, I really like it. But we've been listening to it for a few years, but you've been really excited about it. Is there anything that's tied to it? Yes. Okay. That's mine and my partner's song. Oh, okay. And so I we looked on the account. We found out, hey, she created her own account on Spotify, where that was a song and a bunch of other explicit songs. And I was like, okay. Uh, we have to have this talk now. What have you guys done? Like, what, what are the, because it was, I mean, I can listen to like whatever music. I'm a grown ass right. man. Sorry, I'm a grown man. Right, right. And <laughs> I would not, I was not comfortable listening to some of that music. And um, so we started unraveling everything out. And, and as soon as you started pulling a little bit of the string, everything came apart. And so we were able to like uncover all the truth of where, what she had been doing. And then we get to the more important point of why. And I know like why for us, it's always been the most important question. Right. Why do we do what we do? Um, the kids have always asked me, daddy, why do you work in politics? Why do you work in activism? Why do you, why do you work with these things? And I explain that. And when they do something wrong, I said, why did you, why did you make that decision? Mm -hmm. You had plenty of options, but that was the decision you made. And so we started working through that. And, and then we uncovered, hey, I just, I don't know that I'm different. I know that I'm different than other people. Um, I know that I'm myself and that's different than other people. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, 
but she said, I don't know if I'm supposed to be with boys. I don't know if I'm supposed to be with girls. I don't know right. where I'm supposed to go with this whole relationship thing. Right. A very natural question, in my opinion. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Like you're, you're like, like, and, and I want this to, I want people to be clear when they're hearing this. Cause I know you said, Hey, like I come from a conservative background. My wife comes, you know, conservative background. Uh, same here. My wife is more conservative as well. And I think it's important to let people know that we do recognize these are not out of the ordinary questions for a teenager to ask themselves, right? Yeah. They're trying to figure out who they are. Do I like girls? Do I like boys? You know, which, you know, if I, you know, uh, what type, tall ones, short ones, you know, all that good, all those good questions, you know, th these, this is part of coming of age it is to try to figure out who you are. And, you know, it's a challenge. It is. And and so for us, like we sat down and we said, we can't tell you what your preferences are. We can't mm -hmm. tell you what you like. I said, I, we sat her down and she was just getting started with softball at the time. I said, why do you like softball? Why don't you like football? Why don't you like soccer, gymnastics, all these other things? She's like, I don't know. I just like this one. I'm like, that's fine. That's perfect, perfect reason. I just am attracted to this thing. And so, you know, we kind of broke that down and we continue to have kind of those lighter side of the back conversation of like, Hey, you know, like, let's just talk through these things. Let's work through these things. And, and, um, in the end, um, we had to come to the, to the determination that the, the educational benefits of that school, while they were great, kind of because of the group of friends that she was stuck with, you know, we're talking about a work week of 30 to 40 hours a week of being in the school around mm -hmm. these kids and these mindsets. Are we able to compete as parents with that 30 to 40 hours a week with both right. of us working so much? How am I supposed to compete with that in helping making sure that we're one, giving her, not forcing her one way or the other, but giving her the opportunity to see that there's more options than what's being fed to her um, mm -hmm. through her circle of friends. And so because of that, we actually pulled her out. And and some people may find this controversial as well. We've, we've been doing online homeschooling. So mm -hmm. she's at home. She has some friends through the, through the homeschool network, but for the most part, they're across the state. So she doesn't have really many friends around, but she does still utilize so uh, softball to go through through that for the social because i know right. everyone's always worried about mm -hmm. the social aspect of that right i don't know there's enough weirdos out there i don't i don't think we need to be that social anymore but um but, right, right. but it, it, it we were able to kind of come through that determination and she understood and she accepted that and so we were able to through all of that um i think that our biz biggest successes was that one, she understands that she can talk to us. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that that leads to, because she's 14 years old now, she's going to be 18 years one day. She's going to be 21 years old one day. She's going to be, you know, a, a grown woman one day. And I hope that this conversation that I had with her over how uncomfortable it was for both of us, that this opens up that opportunity for her for a lifetime of being able to come and say, hey, Dad, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm right. stuck. And I'll say, good. I don't know either. Like we can, we can parse through this and we can talk about our options. Right. Um, but it really does. So we were able to find our success on that. We were able to continue with that schooling. It was to help her become a, uh, she wanted to at that time, either be a veterinarian or to be a, um, I'm blanking on it. Uh, an engineer for, for AI. Like okay. two wildly different schools, of course, but sure, she, sure. but both very tailored. And so she, through this homeschooling initiative, we still have those opportunities. We're still working through her on that. And so we're still setting her up for success. It's a different path. We still have a good relationship with our daughter and she is more comfortable in her own skin and being able to go. If I don't know what I'm doing, I'm not going to let just one person be able to dictate how I'm going to have a, a, a an external view or even an internal view. And so I think that the my proudest part of this is that her self-confidence through this 
of questioning everything of like, what do I do? Where am I going? Who do I like to going? I know who I am. I know right. what I, I like. And I'm not afraid to have conversations with people who want to challenge that. Right. And no, I think that's, I think that's, I, I think that's pretty phenomenal. Um, and I would argue again, as a guy who's only got a five-year-old, um, I would argue that conclusion basically required, you know, her lifetime of your effort, right? Like it, it wasn't something that you could start once the problem, you know, I don't want to say problem, but once, once this particular situation came about, that's not when you can start and say, okay, now we're going to start taking interest because then by then it might be too late. You might have kind of ruled yourself out. So you've got to start earlier and kind of build that relationship. And I like to say it like this, the conversation that we have, you know, tomorrow's conversation depends on how we engage today. Right. And, and I tell this to people in, in all forms, right. Whether it's personal family matters or just friendships or work relationships, whatever the case may be. If I'm unpleasant with you today, if we're trying to have a conversation and I'm being an unpleasant person, then later when there might be a more pressing conversation to have, you, you, we, I, I may have burned that bridge in a sense, or at least, you know, maybe not burned it entirely, but burned it enough um, because it doesn't have to be burnt all the way down. Like I think people, you know, yeah. there can be a, a limited bridge. And I think it's especially true of children. Like I said earlier, where like, hey, I know I can come to dad with, or mom with one of these things, but some of these topics over here, not so much. And I think that's where it's on, you know, the job of a parent to be as consistent and as open and, and willing to hear your child out. Because at the end of the day, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think the children, I think most children, especially when they're raised in a, in a good home, I think most children want to do right by themselves and their parents and their family. You know, they don't yes. want to embarrass the family. They don't want to cause conflict in the family. They don't want to be fighting with mom and dad, right? They would rather, you know, all right, it's movie night. Let's sit down and grab the popcorn. You know, you get the popcorn. I'll get the, you know, the chairs set up or whatever, you know, you know, the couch set up, you know, with all the pillows or whatever, you know, however, you know, whatever the case may be. And, and so I think, I think these are things again that have to be started when they're young. And so that by the time you get to some of these challenges, you have built this relationship that's tight knit and you can fall back on that, right? Like you have this foundation to work with. Cause if you didn't have that foundation, it could have, it seems to me like this could have turned out wildly different. Yes. Right? And who knows what wildly different looks like. Um, it could just be at a bare minimum, um, you know, a, a very sour relationship at this point. Right. Like, OK, I'm obeying. I'm doing what you say, but we don't have that kind of relationship where we're enjoying each other's company. And you should. Right. Like, obviously, you want to enjoy your child's company. So there's a, you, go ahead. Um, there's a really good example of exactly what you talked about that I wanted to bring up for this. And 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 it goes actually to the contrary in, in some ways. Um, there's a, a girl and very close to our family, and I don't want to you know, define who she is or, or out her or her family in any way. Um, but she was willing to talk with us because mm -hmm. we've always had that open of open dialogue with anyone and everyone, everyone who comes into our house, you know, we don't try to pry into people and everything else, but you know, we, people who are routinely in our house, if they come by, they hang out, stay the night, like we want to get to know them. We want to get to know them, their parents and everyone that's involved. Um, um, so we had a girl that, that came by and, you know, it, we saw a sudden change in clothes and the, one of the parents had told us that the name had changed, that their child's name had changed. And it went from a feminine name to a very masculine name. Mm -hmm. And we were like, okay, well, we can accept this. And, and, you know, we continue to, to allow them in and and you know we asked you know is this what you prefer you know yada 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 open up the conversation and um you know 
understanding that children have a lot of emotion for why they make the decisions that they make and understanding that sometimes there's, there's logic and foundation behind what they're doing. Sometimes there isn't. We, we had to make sure that we foster that relationship with this, this individual. Um, meanwhile, the parents hadn't, the parents had heard, Hey, there's this inclination that our kid may be transitioning. And because there's this inclination, what we're going to do is we're going to jump off the board with them. We're going to take that jump and we're just going to dive in right in, buy them new clothes, help mm -hmm. do anything and everything. So we are not going to be the parent in this. We are going to be the assistant in this. Right. The friend. And exactly. The friend. And so from that, we were able to kind of uncover. And, and I don't want this to be portrayed as this is typical for kids transitioning. I don't want to. This is one simple anecdote that uh, that has happened in my life. Um, we through our conversation of figuring out, hey, so you want to go by this new name? Yes. So you want to change your clothes? Yes. So, you, you know, you want to you want to go do all these things? Yes. Why? I, I don't want to push it. I don't want to like impede on you. I don't I'm just curious, like just from my own understanding, why? And it made them very uncomfortable, made her incredibly uncomfortable. Well, I had my first period and if I was a boy, I wouldn't have them anymore. Mm. That is, Oh, it hurt. Right. Nobody took the time to ask why. Right. Nobody gave an opportunity or an air to be able to speak and flesh out ideas. And so as soon as that came up, I said, hey, I'm all in support. If you want to transition, if you want to wear boy clothes, if you want to do these things, if you want to act more masculine in that way, um, but no matter how you behave, unless you have surgery, which won't be until you're an adult, you're, you're going to have those periods. And she said, but right. my friends told me, my friends told me that if I do this, I won't. And that's, right. that was the biggest eye opening thing for me as a father, because let's face it we've we've all kind of got stuck in on social media on those conspiracy theories um mm -hmm. we everyone loves a good theory some of them are better than others right but some of us get sucked into them when every once in a while yep. but when yep. it's your friends pushing it on you and you don't have the wherewithal you don't have right. everything available to fact check them right how far down do our kids get before they have before they make a decision that's going to make a long lasting impact or make a, you know, even lifelong impact. Right. How are we going to set ourselves up to make sure that we are always as parents to our own children, as, as guardians to our children, as shepherds mm -hmm. to our children, how are we going to make sure that we are able to be there for them in the way that they need it rather than just, you know, as kind of as the way that we both have been avoiding it instead of just being a, a hard and fast and, and true mm -hmm. like dictator of their lives. How do we allow them to be successful, but guiding them through those, those, uh, right. through those areas of success. And, and I think, I think again, there are parallels to other topics, right? Because I remember, and you remember, and probably everybody else that's our age will remember when we were growing up and our friends were communicating new ideas or, you know, trying to get us to, to try something out, like, Hey, try out these cigarettes, right? They're, they'll make you look cool or whatever, whatever we were telling ourselves back then. Right. And it's no big deal. You're not going to, well, now we know that the consequences of cigarette smoke are much greater than we were told by our friends, you know, because mm -hmm. our friends don't have all the answers for one reason or another, you know, mostly because, they're young and they haven't really spent any time exploring some of this. Some of it might be because, Hey, the information is not quite out there yet. When I was, when I was 15, I'm pretty sure now I'd have to go back and really dig in, but I'm pretty sure that it wasn't nearly as widespreadly, uh, you know, widespread and understood as, uh, it is today 
that cigarette smoking has tremendous negative impacts on your health, especially in the long term. So yeah, maybe, maybe checking it out this once or twice, no big deal, probably going to be just fine in the long run. But what happens when my body decides, Hey, now I'm craving it. Now I want it. And so now this has become a more habitual thing for me. So now this has become part of my life. You know, what are the consequences of that? What are the consequences of, Oh, I don't want to have this bodily function. And maybe there are some things that I can do to minimize it, make it go away, whatever. Um, you know, but what are the long-term impacts of that? You know, what am I setting myself up for? And is that really what I want in the future? And, and, and maybe it is, but the problem is that when you're young, you don't really have that answer. I mean, because you don't have a whole lot of answers, actually. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't necessarily have the answer, you know, of like how to navigate social relationships all the time just in high school. You know, just something that you might think of it as more simple then what is my identity forever going to be right like i i would so i would say that there are a lot of decisions that children cannot make and it's up to the parents to be parents and to push back but at the same time kind of like what you did um build that relationship such that you have a foundation to work with when it's time to become a parent and i think that's that like hopefully that is a big takeaway for people that are watching this takeaway isn't you know oh my god if my child comes to me and says they're trans it must be all their friends you know pushing them into us and you know what are they doing late at night are they on some you know sketchy website you know talking to people that maybe they don't belong talking to like i don't think we need to leap to those uh you know we need maybe keep that on the table but not make that leap but instead you know make sure that we are prepared for that moment in the same way that we prepare for any other moment like you know you and i are in the liberty movement um people talk about you know owning a firearm and you know going and training you know so that should you need it you are ready right sure. some people are preppers and they're like all right we're you know we're stocking up some food we got we got our go bag you know we've got things in case society collapses we're ready to go you know some of it's much much simpler than that some people are like hey i am building you know, my financial nest egg so that I am prepared to retire, whatever, you know, whatever the, the economy is like when, it, when we get to that point, I am prepared. And I think in the same way, we need to prepare ourselves for some of these challenging conversations that need to be had with our children because today my child is five, trans is a thing, but honestly, it, by the time he gets to be 14, it may be something entirely different, you know, and, and that may no longer be the thing anymore. Or it might be, I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't imagine it'll last 10 years, roughly 10 years. You know, usually kids, you know, generations cycle in and out of different things, you know, so what was a big deal for you and I uh, when we were kids, it's not necessarily going to be what's a big deal for our kids, you know, necessarily. So hopefully that's come across to everybody. And this is, you know, and, I, and I've appreciated you coming on and telling your story. And I know we're getting close to time. So is there, is there any other part of this story that you want to kind of start leading toward our close with? Oh, I, I just, I don't, I think that the biggest thing and the biggest challenge that I face through all of this is I'm just like you and just like any other dad. I don't have an answer book in front of me. I don't have mm -hmm. the recipe for success. I don't have any of these things. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, all you can do is support. You can love and you can cherish them and you mm -hmm. can help give an opportunity, um, an opportunity for them to be open with you. Um, a lot of a lot of us uh, grew up in households that we had issues with the way our parents did. Um, mm -hmm. And I would challenge us all just to reflect on those things and and to be the best parent that you can be for your kid, learn from your parents, whether it's the good or the bad or the ugly and, and just challenge yourself to be better. And, and as you said, you know, that foundation, the best time to start building that foundation is today. Um, not when problems arise, but build those pathways in now, um, whether your kid is, is five days old, five years old or, or 15, 25 years old. Um, try to find ways to, to be able to give, your wisdom and your experience to them and help them through um, 
it's a it's a challenging world that we live in and as you said you know each generation is going to be different so the generation that we're facing now and and the challenges and trials and tribulations that they're facing it's going to be different than their kids and and even um potentially even if you have kids with a, an age gap i've got a five-year-old as well now so yeah, we'll, we'll be facing <laughs> we'll be facing their their social trials together um right. on that front so awesome well uh jason it's been a absolute pleasure talking with you about this topic um i enjoyed hearing your story i enjoyed talking to you about it it sounds like from my perspective it sounds like you're doing a heck of a job in a good way you know and i encourage you to definitely keep doing that and you know maybe when it's you know maybe in a few years we have a conversation you know and, and you'll have something different to talk about uh you know you come back on the show you know at some point in the future and then you know hey last time i was on here it was my you know it was my 13 year old i think he's a 14 year old my 14 year old uh now now it's my 14 year old but a different one you know or whatever <laughs> you know whatever the case may be and this is where we are and you know and and this is this is how we've grown because hopefully like i won't mince words i think i think there were probably mistakes made and i don't mean that in a negative way just general normal standard mistakes you know that you look back and you're like ah, i could have done a little bit better there and you know maybe i should have said this instead you know those kind of those kind of situations and so maybe you know when you're looking back you'll you know those things will allow you to be even a better parent as you go forward not for just the the younger one but also the older one as well so. definitely definitely always learning always growing and always pushing forward uh to be better for them so i i appreciate it. today's conversation was was amazing it was a little difficult um right. just because you had to relive some of those things but i appreciate it so much for letting me come on and talk through this awesome stay uh stay i'm gonna put you backstage hold up for just a minute while i close out the show and then you know we'll you know we can we can chat for a, a couple minutes or so uh so give me just a minute here all right folks i hope that you enjoyed the show i hope you found it informative and inspiring i want you to be sure to catch me monday through friday 7 a.m eastern for an informed discussion on politics and culture. Make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel, or if you prefer my Rumble channel, you can go to youtube.libertydad.com. You can also go to rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, let me know how I'm doing by leaving me a comment. Last but not least, I want you to remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week. Catch you next time, but for now, I'm out. <laughs>